The first step is assuming responsibility for advocacy. I don't mean to imply that everyone has the same responsibilities in advocacy because, frankly, we don't. There's a difference between advocacy from the front lines of a library to grassroots advocacy within a neighborhood or an academic community uh, and, and advocacy in senior decision-making circles. But all advocacy begins with a bone-deep conviction and a personal decision that says, I do have a role and a responsibility. Now, we haven't always done this within librarianship. Why not? There are several barriers to developing a culture of advocacy, and we need to acknowledge and address these barriers within ourselves and within our library communities as well. One barrier, of course, is the sheer volume of work that we all deal with, and the feeling that, although advocacy is important, we're just too busy to invest in relationship development and the advocacy essentials that may not have immediate payback. Another barrier is the notion that it's someone else's job. It's the job of the university librarian. It's the job of the library director. It's the job of the department head. In other words, we tend to delegate this upward. Libraries also do a distressing amount of upward delegation to their associations, as if advocacy from the local community were somehow optional. It isn't. As American politician Tip O'Neill famously said, all politics is local. Or there's the entitlement argument, a belief that we really shouldn't have to advocate, since libraries are in the business of doing good, and are therefore simply entitled to support. Or we may simply be afraid because, among other things, advocacy involves speaking up and may even get to the point of requiring some form of public speaking. And we all know that that is the thing that people fear the most. Or we may simply prefer to avoid the fray. Many in the library community opt out of advocacy because for them, the decision-making environment seems not just distant from their world, but it is, quote, political and repugnant. When they say someone is political, they don't mean it as a compliment. So they avoid it altogether. Or some are more comfortable in continuing protest, sometimes to the point of demonizing decision-makers. Protest may be tempting, and it may make us feel better, but it gets people's backs up and it often blocks the opportunities for dialogue that we need most. So protest doesn't always advance the cause and it can actually undermine the efforts of advocates who are patiently trying to create better understandings that can help bridge gaps in agendas. Or we may believe that there's simply no point in advocacy because the situation that we're looking at is hopeless. There is certainly some truth to the old axiom that we have to pick the hills that we are prepared to die on. But as one of my library board members said at a meeting long ago, don't behave as if something doesn't matter when it does. Finally, and I think this may be a big one, even if we don't say it aloud, we simply aren't confident that we know how to advocate in any way other than to protest. I don't think we should be surprised about this, since there are almost no courses in, on advocacy in our library science programs. However, this is changing. The American Library Association, which accredits university programs in library science, specifies in its statement of core competencies that a graduate should understand the importance of advocacy. And the more recent Salzburg curriculum which was proposed to guide the education of library and museum professionals, refers to advocacy as a core requirement. So we are beginning to address this gap in professional education. And furthermore, you're here in a huge international class of aspiring advocates. We can do this. 
I have asked participants in many advocacy workshops over the years to describe the advocates that they most admire. Most choose famous examples such as the late Nelson Mandela. They describe these advocates as charismatic and eloquent. The implication is more or less that these advocates were born that way. And uh, if we weren't born that way, then we couldn't possibly be great advocates. People also describe their favorite advocates as well-informed, determined, patient over time, persistent, well-networked, courageous, and evidently passionate. In advocacy training sessions, I have had participants in a number of workshops do a couple of personal exercises that you can do yourself. The worksheets are in this week's package of resources. One exercise is called Finding Your Passion. The other is called Finding Your Courage. In the passion exercise, you'll reflect on your concerns about the future to identify your personal passion about libraries and librarianship. This core of passion is unique to each one of us. Knowing what your fire in the belly is, is going to help sustain you through the many ups and downs of advocacy. In the courage exercise, you're going to look back at a time when you decided to take a risk on a matter of principle. You'll recall how you felt before, during, and after the risk. So do that. We'll check back next week on what you discovered. We've reviewed the barriers and started to tap into your passion and courage. In the next video, we'll surmount the barriers and begin to communicate our story.